This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Join us next June for the Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine Brewers Retreat to the Ultimate Brewing Experience in Booth Bay Harbor, Maine. Don't miss the chance to brew with some of the world's best brewers like Jason Perkins of Allagash, Phil Wymore of Perennial, Will Myers of Cambridge Brewing, Neil Fisher of Weldworks, Sean Lawson of Lawson's Finest, Sam Richardson of Other Half, and more. Enjoy fabulous food, fantastic beer, and a -a one-of-a-kind brewing experience at an oceanfront luxury resort. Tickets are selling fast. Visit BrewersRetreat.com or give us a call at 888-875-8708, extensions zero to secure your spot now. Welcome to the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Bogner, co-founder and editorial director of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. My guest on the podcast today is one of the uh, better known publicans in the world of American craft beer, Chris Black of Falling Rock Tap House. Welcome to the podcast, Chris. Thanks for having me on. You, you recently uh, made some waves in the world of brewing by posting a very long, as you described, dense uh, uh, blog post about where, how you view um, you know, where craft beer is growing, going today and some of the uh, bleeding over on the three-tier system as breweries uh, become destinations in and of themselves. Um, maybe outline quickly for us uh, you know, the, the framework for this argument. I, I know it's a big one. You don't need to discuss yeah, the whole it, thing. But in a nutshell, what, uh, you know, <laughs> could you boil it down to you know, a few uh, points so that we can uh, start our conversation there? I think the easiest way is, hey, you're stepping on my toes. Uh, sure, you know, sure. and get it down that far, but uh, no, it's it's. There's an awful lot of people getting in the industry that don't really understand the history and why things are how they are. Yeah, and I just kind of I got tired of explaining stuff like that, and I thought, well, you know, maybe we need to just start having a little bit more of a discussion on that. So I, I kind of wanted to, you know, state, you know, what what is the three tier system and why why is it in place and and uh, you know the basic concept is like hey you know i wish we could run like an experiment and and see what the marketplace looks like without the three-tier system and oh wait you can go to any country on the planet and see what that looks like which is that if you go to a restaurant it has one kind of beer uh, because they have a contract with whatever the large you know the largest brewery in that country or the large or breweries in that country and that's all you can get and we have had a different situation here in the United States with the three-tier system, which was designed to prevent vertical integration uh, from top to bottom on uh, alcoholic beverage sales. And it has served us pretty well because we have the most vibrant uh, small producer uh, industry for beer in the entire world and everybody else around the world. Uh, is trying to emulate what we're doing, but they don't really have yeah. that outlet. Sure, sure. Um, if you open up a brewery in, say, Germany or something like that, um, you can't go get taps at any other right. place. So that kind of shuts down your but ability also to grow. Yeah, but that does also, you know, if you look at the number of breweries per capita, you know, in Germany and Belgium, they're on par with where America is today in terms of the number of breweries, you know, you know per per population. Um, the breweries have had a different focus, you know, I would, and I think if you look at, you know, German and Belgian breweries, they are much more focused on serving their, you know, immediate environment Correct. or, uh, you know, if you're a German brewery, just, you know, serving beer straight out of the, out of their own beer garden rather right. than packaging and, and shipping beer, you know, through this kind of, uh, you know, industrial distribution channel. Um, well, because that, yeah. that's the only outlet <laughs> sure. available to sure. you. Sure. Um, you know, you know, but in that sense, you know, you're right. If you go to England and you're looking for a great pub with a whole bunch, you know, with a lot of you know selection of beer, you're just not really going to find it. It's, it, it's, it's tough. Yeah. You can. There right. are some free houses out there. There are some in Germany, too. But you can, I mean, literally, I think in Germany you can count them on two hands. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's just not as much of a thing. And so as a small brewer, you have a very limited, you know, ability to get any larger than what you are. And, um, you know, that's not the case here in the United States. And, you know, here you have that option. You can just be the corner brewery down the street. And there's plenty of breweries doing that out here. I mean, you know, we just passed 7,000 breweries in the United States recently. And tons of them are um, just, it's the neighborhood brewery. 
Right. And, and that's not a problem. That's always what it's been available. I mean, there are some states around where you're not allowed to really serve on, on at your own brewery very much. I mean, you, you have to take a tour and it has to be a certain length and you have to pay for right, it. And, right. Oh, you can give a couple samples and those things are limited. You know, how much beer you can give out or sell to a person. I know in some states, I mean, we were just talking early. It's like, it's like 36 ounces that you can sell to somebody after they finish their tour and then you have to boot them out. And, uh, I mean, there are states like that, and I've always, you know, kind of chafed at that. I didn't think that we should have those kind of restrictions, but yeah. um, there's always been kind of you know, an unwritten uh, code of how to conduct business so that you don't discourage um, people from visiting your accounts. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, usually from uh, your perspective, and that, you know, I think you know, if there are brewery owners out there listening, you know, they they have their own self-interest. You have your own self-interest Correct. as a business owner. All these self-interests, you know, are, are moving together. The distributors in the third three-tier system have their mm-hmm. own self-interest. You know, sometimes those self-interests, you know, uh, are move together, you know, uh, in sync. Sometimes, you know, those self-interests rub up against each other. Oh, you know, definitely. And, and, you know, conflict arises. The, the system was really kind of set up so that each part supports the other. And it's kind of a symbiotic relationship. Is that is that why? It was, I mean, f- from my recollection of why the three tier system was put in place, it was put in place to disempower, you know, uh, um, the oh, mob, completely. basically, you know, by you know who had control over you know distribution channels because they had the best logistics out there. By breaking this up, you know, between producers and distribution, I mean, yeah, you you took the mob out of the business. Well, you also took out the larger breweries who were. Um, they were causing problems in the marketplace. They were monopolistic. They were controlling prices. They were fixing prices. And there was no competition. There was usually a lot of times agreements between breweries as to territories. And I get everything here. You get everything over on this side. And we don't compete with each other head to head. And therefore, we can charge more. Right, right. Four things. And then they controlled all the bars in the, in the area. If you had competing breweries and, and say, like in Milwaukee and Chicago and sure. larger towns, you had comp- competition going on between the breweries. And they were buying up all the uh, bars because they wanted to control all the distribution channels. And that was seen as a very negative situation, just like all monopolies uh, sure. around the turn of the previous century. And... They wanted to break up that kind of thing. Yeah. And so they put stops in place to prevent that from happening. And, you know, I understand breweries chafing at some of the rules like, well, why can't I do that? And I'm like, well, because if you can do that, then so can Big Beer. Sure, sure. And, and I guess that's, it, you know, And then it comes yeah. down to money and guess right. who has money and who doesn't. And that's certainly our question. You know, if you're in a state like California, I think you can operate six tap rooms, you know, as a, with a production brewery license. If you're in Colorado, you can operate, I think, two for every production brewery license. Uh, various states have different laws about these kinds of things. But the ultimate, you know, intent is to not necessarily allow those production breweries that are manufacturing beer on a large scale to also control their own distribution as well as the retail sale of that entirely because in, in doing that I think what you say is an interesting one if we moved away from that three tier system do we end up with a system where Anheuser-Busch owns all the bars and puts all of their own brands into all of those bars um, you know on the flip side I mean there's still that consumer and competitive argument to say that they could try to do that but in states that don't restrict the number of you know production brewery licenses, it's always possible then in that kind of scenario for a smaller brewery to launch, get a foothold, and just sell beer out their own door. And so in that case, you know, is that really a worst case scenario that we should even consider? Well, I mean, sure, you can open up a place, but does that mean that you have any chance of succeeding? That's that's the big question. Right. When when just money becomes, you know the only qualifier, um, the small guy's always going to lose. Um, you know, you'll, you'll never be able to get any ROI on, you know, all that money that you put out for it. If, if your scale is too small, I mean, uh, and if that's your only option, is that really even, is that a viable option? Right. Does that competition mean anything? Um, right now, the way things are, are set up, um, you know, there is that opportunity. You can become 
you know, New Belgium did it. I mean, they're, they're a million right. barrels. You know, Odell's, uh, you've got other breweries here in this area. Uh, and in other states, you've had the same thing happen. You've had growth happen to where it is act- actually impacting the market. Um, and that's why you get Anheuser Bush, you know, fighting back buying uh, small breweries to include in their portfolio because every time they've attempted to make beer to appeal to that crowd, it's been monstrously unsuccessful. With with a couple of in, uh, exceptions, I mean, you know, yeah. Blue Moon, um, Shock Top, mm-hmm. but those weren't aimed at right at right. the at the the geek or the the serious beer people. They were aimed at a, a much lower level. You see some of that competition here in Denver yourself because Anheuser Busch and Ten Barrel, one of their acquired brands, opened up their own brew pub right here uh, in your backyard. Oh yeah, and uh, yeah, <laughs> not too far away from you here at Falling Rock. Um, you know, and and that and they are doing the same thing and, and uh, repeating that strategy around the country. They've opened one in San Diego, and uh, I think they've got one in Boise, a few other places. Um, you know, and that's certainly part of their strategy. You know, Anheuser Busch sees the, the the value in going direct to consumer. Um, you know, if they're doing this. On a large, you know, multi-state kind of platform with some of their craft breweries. Um, you know, why then do you think smaller craft breweries shouldn't also look at how they emulate that strategy and sell directly to those consumers? Clearly, you know, they've they've got researchers and they know this is a good strategy and they're willing to put millions of dollars behind it. Um, or the small guys, you know, at then at a disadvantage if they don't behave that way. Um, well, I'll just I'll just say this: if you open up a second tap room in a, say a market that you had good success with. Um, um, you're going to find that you're going to lose all the taps around that you're going to create holes in your marketplace. And it's a whole lot easier to stand on more legs than it is to stand on one. And you're going to be relying on just your outlets to sell your beer instead of relying on, Hundreds and yeah. thousands of potential places to go sell your beer. You know, I'm I'm, I'm wondering about this, and because you know, bear with me here. I want to have a, you can yeah. you can see it. Yeah. in the marketplace, there was a brewery that I, uh, a few years ago I did a very vocal um, uh, telling them to go themselves. And <laughs> you can uh, say whatever you want. We're well, not I, we're not over the air. <laughs> but it is I I. I Flat out told them to go fuck themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and it was pretty vocal. And um, and that for people that aren't familiar with it, I'll you know it's, yeah. it was Oscar Blues Brewery who opened up a concert venue uh, also very close to you here. Yeah, four uh, blocks. Yeah, four blocks. Yeah. A brand that you felt some investment in because you'd helped them build the brewery yeah, and, I, and the brand from the uh, from the early I was days and help popularize their beer. I was their second account outside of their own pub. I was their first account in the Denver uh, area. And uh, we helped them very much get into, I mean, it became a standard tap in this area of town. I mean, they had, you know, lots and lots of taps. Sure. Uh, they have none now. Hmm. None. I haven't seen an, an Oscar Blues handle yeah. other than in their own restaurants lately very much at all. Um, the same things happened with another brewery that's opened up here. They had hundreds of handles. Um, they're down to dozens right now. Uh, and it's, it's, I'm just the one that's going to tell you why right. I'm doing it. Sure, the other sure. people just do it. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> right, they, they right, don't create right. a scene about, they just, they just yeah. go like, yeah, I'm not just not carrying your stuff anymore. I found it interesting because a couple weeks ago when I was talking to Jack Hendler from Jack's Abbey, he mentioned to me that 80% of their volume is done within, you know, four or five miles of the brewery. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're doing about 50,000 barrels Mm -hmm. of beer. It's a great size, you know, very large scale brewery at this point, brewing lagers, Um, you know, and, you know, so his experience on that was there, but there are ways that's growing up with them. That's not adding satellite tap rooms and additional places. Um, You look at San Diego. Um, North Park with those six licenses where one is an actual production and they can have five additional right. places, just tap rooms. They don't have to have any brewing on site or anything like that. They can just go in there and they've, uh, a lot of breweries have gone into where they used to sell their beer, yeah. which was North Park was the, you know, craft centric area of, of San Diego and the bar owners in that place in that area of town are just like, yeah, you come into this neighborhood. Um, yeah, we're not carrying any of your product anymore. I mean, go try to find a stone handle 
all around San Diego, there's whole areas of town where you just you just don't find them. And they sell a lot of beer. You know, it's it's one thing. We have Great Divide right down the street. There's six blocks from here. Right. And we've always carried Great Divide. And they've always had, I mean, they started a tap room in there. I mean, it used to be just a keg box sitting next to the bottling machine. And then they put in a real tap room. And, um, you know, I love going over there. It's, it's terrific. It's, it's yeah. a good place. But they close up their tap room early. Um, their six pack prices to go are not undercutting the liquor store or the grocery sure, stores sure. prices. Um, they don't charge, you know, ridiculously cheap prices in the tap room either. It's a place to go experience and go visit the mothership and, 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 you know, get the touchy feely of that, that brewery. And I've always been a huge supporter of that. And that doesn't bother me. But when you start adding those extra places where you're just looking to get the retail sale, um, because they're not the customer is not getting the same experience of visiting the real the the brewery, um, you know. And and in in the article, I I, I said, look, there, you know, if you want to go into a uh, you know a closed market venue like a like a basketball arena or the airport or something like that, I'm going to be first in line there drinking beer there because you know those are completely controlled by the ABs of the world. And if you're getting in there with some good beer, I'm very supportive of it. But you kind of got to watch out whose toes you're stepping on. Because um, when you're setting up your brewery to be a substitute for a bar, um, we already yeah. ha- we have bars. And See, that's, yeah. that's, that's the thing. Yeah. The small brewer was granted exceptions to the three-tier system. And the BA gets pissed every time I say <laughs> the word exceptions. Uh, and and it is a privilege. Yeah. Everything that we do, sure, every sure. business is granted a license, and that is a privilege to do that whatever thing that you got the license for. Right. Whether it's hauling trash, or you know, uh, operating just a, a retail flower shop, or a brewery, or a bar, or a restaurant, we have we all have business license for that, and that grants us certain privileges. And there were exceptions to those privileges that were granted to foster the growth of this, you know, small industry and to encourage it so that the the little guy had a chance to do something. And sometimes uh, some of the changes in the laws that some of the breweries, especially some of the newer breweries are pushing for, um, really start like, hey, wait a second, we already have a place for this. And, and it's called, it's, it's called, a, you know, a, a liquor license. And I have certain things that I can do and certain things that I can't do. Brew pubs are allowed to do something different from what production manufacturing brewers are allowed to do. And kind of, <laughs> kind of, no. Yeah. And, and, you know, well, a brew pub so, usually can right. have like wine and spirits right, and other people's right. beers and things like that. But they usually have a cap on how much that they're allowed to sell. Sure. You know, here in Colorado, it's 60,000 barrels up until a couple of years ago. Uh, in Arizona, it was 40,000 barrels and right. four peaks, you know, railed and, oh, my God, it's so horrible that we're going to have to you know, shut down things. It's like you set up your business knowing that you had a cap of 40,000 barrels and now you want to increase that to 250,000 barrels. And I had a lot of time on my hands when that was going on. Um, so I was like, you know, you got to watch out for the unintended consequences. Because if you set that number too high, it all of a sudden becomes viable for somebody with an awful lot of money and much bigger production to come in and participate in that. There are, you know, I think there are always ways that Look, where businesses with deep pockets are going to find ways around. Oh yeah. And Breckenridge has done that here in Colorado, and they can produce, <laughs> I think, 30,000 yeah. barrels well, they, per license, and they just get six licenses, they can make, make as much beer as they want. But, yeah. you know, I think the... But nobody wanted to buy any of it. Okay? <laughs> Fair enough. And they, put, um, they, and they put themselves out of business. And then they got bought. And I think AB bought a pig in a poke, but that's that's you know. Well, that is another subject altogether. Yes. But uh, um, you know, on the on the the flip side, I think um, one to play devil's advocate here. Oh yeah. Um, you know, with beer bars being that kind of gatekeeper to the market traditionally, mm-hmm. you know, and brewers now having to move into small craft breweries, um, you know, 
on such an upswing over the last four years. Um, major, you know, significantly higher numbers of breweries entering the market. Oh, yeah. Still a limited number of influential, you know, taps and beer bars out there to sell their product. A lot of breweries competing for the same space and, and mind share and consumers. You know, you as a beer bar and your beer bars across the country have done the same thing, moved to, you know, significant rotation of those breweries, bringing some folks in, taking some folks off. So from a brewery perspective, you know, they can count so much less on the long term and consistent, I shouldn't say consistent, but, but uh, no, nonstop I- support, uh, you know, from, from you. And so in that kind of environment, are they wrong then to then take things into their own hands and say, hey, I know I can't count on this channel that much anymore because they're rotating it all over the place. I need to you know, build my direct to the consumer channel so that I can speak directly and make sure that uh, you know, I can market this experience of drinking my beer directly to them because that's the only thing that's going to be consistent going forward. Right. Um, here at Falling Rock, we have 92 taps. Of those 92, um, we have approximately 60 handles that are fairly static, uh, um, that are classics, that are really amazing beers that are on the wall uh, pretty much constantly. We have another 10 or so, uh, between 10 and 20, that are more seasonal rotators from some of those same breweries. Uh, and then we have between 10 and 20 uh, numbered taps that we use to rotate in and find new products and try those one-offs and crazy things and everything like that. Because each one of those segments there fills a need for part of my customer base. Um, the places that rotate every single tap every single time you are serving the the needs of one segment of your potential customer base. And so that is, uh, you know, that's how I I look at it. I keep things on. I do business with breweries long term because that's the only way that a brewery can ever really grow. You can't build a big brewery on a new you know, five new beers every single week. It's really challenging to do. I would argue with you that you can't because some have, you know, well, there's, and, there's yeah. some people that have, yeah. have succeeded in it, but they're also sitting there pulling their hair out when you sit there and talk to them. And they're like, how do I keep doing this? Right. I mean, you start to look at the, those costs of that new label that, you know, the, that new can, I mean, well, they all have to do, uh, uh, pressure sensitive labels on on the cans and everything like that's the only way they can do it but even then you're you're still looking at you know a run of labels you know costing and you're not using all of those and some of these times i mean it's it's a real challenge to get to any significant size i mean yes you're putting out things and you're getting your sell through on that thing but what happens i mean that that's a part of the market that doesn't like to drink the same beer twice uh, which is which is really rough. I mean, right. I get it. That is a segment of the market, and that 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 is important to have some things, you know, keeping things fresh and everything like that. And for some of the larger breweries, they have a really hard time keeping up with that and doing stuff like that. Right. And you know, no, I think that speaks to why a lot of us got interested in craft beer, you know, from the very oh, yeah. start. I mean, it was that sense of exploration and that sense of adventure and that mm-hmm. wanting to try new things and. Uh, you know, it's understandable to me why, you know, mm-hmm. why consumers out there in craft beer today and, you know, certain brewers love to decry the untapped culture of people just trying it's, to get, uh, you know, it's the gamification beers, but, of, of of the drinking. And there's there's some of that. But I think, you know, in my experience with, you know, a lot of you know serious beer nerds that also spend a lot of time checking out a whole bunch of different beers, they also drink a lot of the same beer, too. And, uh, and some think, of them do. But yeah, I, I think that gets overlooked in this whole thing. The the. Um, you know the the point being that like there's that still that that uh, psychographic of um, you know folks that are into that exploration and into that adventure and wanting to try new things and that's what has fueled that growth of craft beer 
um, you know, for you as a retailer in the craft beer mm-hmm. world, you have to at the same time feed that sense of adventure, mm-hmm. but also, you know, feed the, the, you're saying there's a different side of your market that really values that consistency over, over that pure sense of adventure. Um, tell me about that customer, because I think that's a customer that, uh, we tend to not pay as much attention to in the, the world of, uh, the hipster world of craft beer. Well, I mean, you know, regulars, they're, they're called that for a reason. And they are a very important core part of a business. Um, you know, just like for the, the brewery, having that, you know, regular uh, um, volume of beer going out of whatever that beer is, um, your, your mainstay IPA or brown ale or whatever, you know, that you, you know that you can produce on a regular basis for the bar. We have that same kind of thing. We have people that we know are going to come in two or three times a week and we can bank on them coming in if I have those beers that they like. And, and a lot of my regulars, I mean, they, they love trying the new IPA that comes on the wall and they'll have one maybe two of those, and then they go right back to their core of three, four, ten beers that they drink from on a regular basis, and they may shift over the, the year, you know, a little bit darker during the, you know, the, the winter months and maybe a little bit lighter in the right. middle of summer when it's 100 degrees out. But, uh, you know, they tend to drink a little bit smaller core of, of things. They're still adventurous. They still like trying the new one that comes out, and they always do. But, you know, it's hard to have those people show up if you don't have their beer. Yeah. They're going to go look for the place that does carry their beer. Yeah. And, you know, we're right next to Coors Field. We're half a block from home plate. You know, so, you know, at the beginning, we've never had any of the the big, you know, breweries on tap. We've had their bottles and we charge. We try to keep uh, so that we have the highest price on the street for those beers. (laughs) And that way, you know, they're, you know. Uh, unadventurous uh, drinking habits uh, subsidizes your adventurous b- drinking habits and keeps the price down for that. For sure, um, we try to have we try to be very fair on our pricing. We have spent a lot of money on our draft system to keep the quality up. We switched how we clean lines so that they are done more consistently. We we spend a lot of time, a lot of money on that. Our glassware we switched up uh, over the last couple of years. Our our uh, half pint glasses, our smaller snifters, they're you know um, Spiegelau's, so they're like some very serious. You know, they're they're five dollars a piece now. Yeah, uh, they're very expensive uh, high end glasses, and our, our pint glasses. We've been looking for a substitute for a shaker pint forever. And could not find anything for years because every single um, uh, alternative um, tended to be too tall. Hmm. And people are like, well, you know, it shouldn't matter. You know, I'm like, but between the top of a bar and the floor is 42 inches. And you have to keep things at least six inches off the ground. And then you put in shelves. And, and so there's there's real estate there. Yeah. And, and if, if the glass is too tall, all of a sudden I lose a shelf. Right. And now my storage went down by 30 or 50 percent. And, you know, sometimes, um, you know, people weren't getting that message. And, and a glass came out recently uh, and, and the name on it is called Revival. And it has a much nicer shape. It actually it is a much nicer compromise on, on being able to actually smell some of the beer and everything like that. And it's the right height. It's not any taller and it's not any bigger around. So it's still fixing the glass racks and everything like that. Um, so, I mean, we, we do little things like that to, to make I drank it an a, SDS pills out of one of those, uh, <laughs> revival glasses, uh, before we started the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. I had like four last night. It was <laughs> beautiful. And, uh, and if you don't know that, that's uh, the Pilsner from Russian River Brewing Company, which we, we uh, I talked to the uh, uh, salespeople and, and Vinny into letting me have some kegs of that uh, here on a pretty regular basis. So uh, that that's a really exciting thing. And SDS is the uh, airport code for yeah. Charles M. Schultz, uh, Sonoma County Airport. Let's um, let's walk it back a little bit. You know, yeah. you brought up the question about uh, you know Oscar Blues and shutting him off, you know, from your spot, and then being mm-hmm. very vocal in the you know uh, about why and how you're doing it because, as you say, they're stepping on your toes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, from a business perspective, do you think that Oscar Blues 
is making is more profitable now running their own spots and even you know because at this point they're even running their own uh uh burger joints uh, and they've got a, a burger, oh, yeah. you know they've 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 just built all of their own retail channels um with restaurant concepts and many of them too in order to you know to build that and are owning the whole piece of the pie from oh, yeah. you know um, I, I think, you know, again, well, to play devil's advocate, you could argue that that might be a more profitable strategy for them than to sell you, you know, $130 kegs of, uh, you know, whatever half barrels of, of whatever it is they're making that the, the profit margin on that's pretty bad. No, I, um, I, you know, in the big picture. No, and, I get yeah. that. And, and, you know, retail is crack for, for, for the brewers. Right. Um, and it is, uh, you know, it is an important part of your, your overall mix and of how you stay in business and everything like that. Um, Oscar blues for interest, uh, for instance, got, uh, involved with, a, you know, an equity firm. Right. And their goal is not about beer. Their goal is to make money. Sure. In fact, the owner, sure. the, 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 uh, main person for that, um, is, is very upfront that he's like, I will make my money. Yeah, yeah. There's not a private equity investor out there in the world that is not in no. it, you know, primarily or almost purely his, to make profit. His sure. his hook, yeah. his point of differentiation versus all the other funds is right. that he's involved in beer. It is is that's his hook. That's his little right. thing. And they're looking for numbers, and they're looking. They want to show growth in things like, hey, uh, Mister Investor. Um, the overall beer industry is flat right now and we're still growing because we're adding all these restaurants and everything like that. So you should invest in our fund. And, but what I'm trying to say is, is that a viable long-term strategy? When you look at the competition in the retail market and in the restaurant industry, you look at in the last eight or nine years at every major market, virtually doubling the number of liquor licenses in it. You look at, here in the Denver area, I mean, we've almost doubled liquor licenses in the last eight years, and we've been very fortunate because we have grown faster than any other major metropolitan market. We've grown a lot. I mean, it hasn't doubled, right? Um, even though it feels like it sometimes, <laughs> um, but we haven't doubled. You can go to other markets. Go to Chicago. They have almost 2% less people living there in the last eight years. And the exact same increase in number of liquor licenses has happened. I have some very good friends there. Uh, Michael Roper, he owns uh, uh, Hopleaf up on the north side. And it's, you know, his neighborhood has gotten just inundated with people coming in with stupid amounts of money. Yeah. And opening up these places. And, and yes, they're, they're doing some business, but... Some of them are going out of business after eight months, and they're completely packed all the time, but they're still not making any money. I think that that brings up an interesting point, and this is one that we've spoken about internally. Um, the idea, you know, the, we believe in a free market. You know, this is America. Competitors have a right to, to enter a market. You oh, know, yeah. another small brewery and another entrepreneur with a dream has a right to jump into the market. Everybody does. Is, you know, if you can get a license and you can, you know, go in front of that judge and they're willing to give it to you um, because you're of good moral character and you're going to behave properly. You know, mm-hmm. great. You can launch. Yeah. You can launch a business and get into this. Um, one of the interesting challenges that comes with that, that the free market is also merciless. And you know that free market can also tear down not only those marginal businesses that get into the business, but also good businesses that, uh, and I think what, you're, what you just mentioned there is the interesting side effect of what we're seeing with some of this expansion, mm-hmm. that the significant number of new players in the markets, many of which do not really have long-term prospects that, mm-hmm. uh, that could be that six to eight months and then they're out of business business can take away from a more secure, stable, and long-term business that has been functioning well, but take enough of their audience just for enough of time, you know, that it puts them in a financial situation where their business is much less sustainable. And so in a lot of sense, you know, this additional competition um, doesn't add to the overall community. It really just creates what some might call a spoiler that ends up um, tearing apart some otherwise, you know, solid, good, high-quality uh, you know, businesses well, you well, know, that otherwise have longevity. You, you're talking about competition and, and competition is, is positive. It's good. I don't, I don't have a problem. I'm not complaining about, you know, somebody who's opening up another beer bar down the street. I, I was pretty much the only beer bar in, in Denver for years. And, you know, we've got 
you know, places down the street. We've got fresh crap right down the street. I don't have any problem with Jason down there. He, he, he did um, his hiring. He did his interviews in the booths upstairs. I gave him actually this is the room that we're in. I gave him when he had to do larger interviews. Um, that wasn't the problem. You know, Justin down the street at Starbar. He does a great job down there. I, I don't have any problem with these people because we're competing on the same field. We have the same rights, the same responsibilities. We have the same overhead kind of uh, situation that we got into. We're on, on, on a level playing field. Um, the multiple tiers aren't, and they were designed not to be a level field. They aren't. They don't. We don't play by the same rules. A brewery doesn't have to get neighborhood approval for their liquor license. That manufacturing permit, the city has no say-so in it. They get to charge them their fee, and that's the end of it. They have to grant it if the state grants it. And, you know, we've got, there's a distillery down the street. And uh, if you're listening to this, you've probably seen the video from that distillery. Um, a FBI agent did a backflip and ended up shooting a patron in the place. It's a full-on discotheque. I mean, it is a nightclub. But they have no local control at all on that place because they have a manufacturing permit. They didn't have to go before a neighborhood and, and a judge to say, okay, you know, you can have this place. And, and you know, it's 2018. Um, and there still are restrictions on dancing. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's so sinful. It's, it's horrific. Next thing they'll be drinking. Gosh. So, um, but you know, they don't, yeah. they don't have to, we are not on a, on, on a level playing field. We don't play by the same rules. And that's what I'm talking about. It, it isn't, it isn't the same. And, you know, there's a lot of breweries that are uh, being designed. They're spending an awful lot of time on latency, keeping that person there for a long period of time. Sure. And that was never really what we were all agreeing to because I was very involved in trying to get the laws changed to allow for breweries to have a tap room so that they could, you know, the guests could have that experience because I always felt that that customer would then go out into the marketplace because the breweries usually shut down early and then, you know, they might come to my bar or the bar down the street and drink those beers. And that's wonderful. But when you try to keep their, them for their whole drinking experience for that day, that starts. It's like, hey, wait a second. This isn't what, you know, this isn't what we all signed on to. Yeah. At some point, though, you know, most of the breweries and, and most of the growth and you know, the largest volume of, of increase in growth in craft breweries is in that under, you know, 15,000 barrel a year range, and which is mm -hmm. all thoroughly within, you know, brew pub realm, mm -hmm. you know, for that matter. Okay. And so, you know, in, in some senses, a lot of these breweries that are not just drawing people into their tap rooms and staying open, you know, long hours from, you know, noon to 10 or noon to midnight, mm -hmm. you know, to service those customers and then also packaging and selling retail retail beer out of their own location or primarily out of their own location, maybe with a few limited retail spots on top of that. You know, these guys aren't really doing anything that brew pubs hadn't been doing themselves, you know, for all that time, other than not also not serving a full menu. But most of those same breweries have food trucks, you know, that, that fill in that kind of gap. And so, you know, conceptually speaking, is there really anything different from what those breweries have done uh, and, uh, you know, what you're talking about with this even playing field? Yeah, no, no, I, I get what you're trying to say. Um, like, for instance, in this state, um, the state of Colorado has always tried to tie food and alcohol service together. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a requirement. Um, there are some states that have higher requirements for certain liquor licenses. Some have to have like 51% food. Right. Uh, here in this state, uh, uh, my liquor license requires 25, which I don't think is an onerous amount or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, brew pubs are required 15% food sales. Um, breweries have zero. And l let me tell you, operating a kitchen is not the profit center. <laughs> Right, right. Okay. It is not the profit center. Uh, I'm lucky if I can make the numbers at the end of the year, uh, black numbers instead of red numbers, you know. Uh, there's a lot of overhead to running a kitchen, a lot of equipment costs, just like a brewery has for their equipment. Sure. that That's their, their cost too. Um, but it, it is a very different animal 
And when you start taking away some of those incremental sales of the alcohol, it's like, you know, hey, guys, if you want me to serve your beer, um, why are we taking, you know, you're, you're, you're taking, you're stepping on the toes a little bit there. And it's just like, look, I have 7,000 breweries to choose from in the United States. I have over 350 in this state alone. Why would I choose to serve your beer when you want to open up a second location down the street from me that has nothing to do with your overall business? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm okay with you having a second facility because you outgrew your first one and you didn't want to close down the first one. You know, Great Divide right down the street. They outgrew their first place and they needed some more space, so they built on a second place. They haven't put in the... The brewing facility, yes, it's just packaging right now, but I'm okay with them having a second tap room over there. That doesn't bother me so much. Um, if you were making clean beers, you know, your IPAs and your brown ales and your pale ales, and you want to do a funky sour thing, and you don't want to contaminate that original brewery, I'm kind of I'm okay with that. But when your only goal is retail sales, that's an issue. You know, so, you know, and I understand what you're saying there. Um, you know, for example, Odell, you know, great brewery in Fort Collins just moved mm-hmm. down, opened up a brewery and they do have a brewery in the facility over here in, uh, in Rhino, you know, and that's a, another brewery that you'd sold a lot of beer from in the past, but now they're yeah. right down the street from you. Um, you know, they had to have made some sort of calculation in thinking about this, that, you know, if Chris stops selling our beer, on that, it's probably better for us, you know, that, that, oh. that still controlling our brand Look, destiny and our right. the relationship with the I mean, the they're definitely going to sell more beer in that place than they sold through here. Yeah. But are they going to sell more beer in that one location than they did in the rest of downtown? Because right now, they don't have many taps down here. Yeah. And they're like, you know, well, you know, hey, um, we used to get more attention down there than we get now. And it's like, you know, well, no, no shit. Um, guess what? Everybody used to get more attention. There used to be, when I moved here, there was 50 breweries in the state. Now it's 350. Yes, that has gotten diluted down. But, um, they're like, well, we're just trying to stay, um, relevant. And I said, you're a brewery. Your way of staying relevant is by putting out beers that people are, are requesting and are wanting and keeping in front of them that way. Um, you're just going after a retail grab here. You're going out there, you're trying to get into the marketplace, and you're putting the place right in the middle of where you were doing business, and you're the only place that you're doing business with. And if you keep doing this at different places, like the Oscar Blues and everything like that, people all around the place start getting the message that you're not a good partner. You're not that one that I want to deal with, because you're, if I'm successful, you're just going to open up next door to me. And there's a brewery out of California that that is their game plan. They came in here. They wanted to do a big kickoff with me. They wanted to sell me some beer. And I'm like, I got to ask you some questions, you know. Um, what happened with this town? And it's like, well, we were selling a whole lot of beer, so we decided to open a pub there. And I'm like, well, then why would any retailer want to serve your beer? Because if I'm successful selling your beer and getting your brand going, you're just going to open up down the street. And the guy just looked at me like, well, of course I'm going to do that. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I don't want to do I don't want to deal with it. Why would I do that? That's against my best interests. You know, I've been a big proponent. I've been a big supporter of this industry for over 35 years. And I, I still, I don't make crap for money. I drive a 2003 Yukon with 3, 300,000 miles on it. I live in a tiny little house, you know, but I'm doing some of the things that I love doing. And I'm involved in this industry that used to be very cooperative and very collaborative. And and now things are changing. And one of the problems is money has gotten involved and that always, you know, causes problems. Plus, there's a lot of people out there that, you know, they're a little bit older than me. I'm in my mid 50s and they're in 60s and, and, and they're starting to think, well, how do I get out of this? You know, how do I right. retire? How do I get that? And if you don't have, you know, the son, the daughter, um, the, the family to continue on the business uh, in, in that way, you know, how do you get that value that you created in this business? And, and I understand that. And, and when you start looking at a brewery that's of a decent size, you know, when you start looking at normal values of a thousand dollars a bar- barrel, I mean, that, that starts adding up really quick. 
you know, and and uh, you know that's causing some problems. But the, you know that's also causing problems with, you know, in, in just about any industry right now. Yeah. Um, but you know you've got Odell's down the street, and um, you know in, instead of you know maintaining their relevancy through their beer and everything like that, they decided that they're gonna you know me too, and you know I, I'm absolutely convinced that they did it because New Belgium did something down the street <laughs> over here. And they're like, well, it's the same thing. I'm like, it actually isn't because New Belgium ha- operates a brewery in the Source Hotel over there, but they don't have the retail sales on that. You know, there was yeah. going to be a yeah. brewery in that building. New Belgium decided that, you know, that they would be the ones in there. And now all of a sudden, Odell, I mean, they just they got to get in there and they got to do whatever, you know, New Belgium right. did. You know? So you mentioned it, that this is happening in every industry, and I think you're absolutely mm-hmm. right there, that this yeah. move toward uh, brands and manufacturers selling direct to consumer, you know, and mm-hmm. maintaining direct relationships with their consumers is not just something that beer faces. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's something that's happening, uh, you know, from uh, clothing manufacturers to furniture makers and every everyone else that uh, this kind of collapsing of the middle and taking that manufacturer direct to or that brand direct, you know, to the consumer um, is a way that, you know, folks are or businesses are able to reduce costs, increase quality and keep their brand relevant, you know, to, to uh, uh, consumers. And so, you know, I, you know, if I were wanting to be critical of you here, no, I would absolutely. say, you know, you, you, you know, some of it sounds like that kind of old curmudgeon that just wants things to be the way that they used to be. Get off my fucking lawn. <laughs> just, you know, absolutely. No, I get that. Right. You but, know, or, you know, what you're messing with my business that I've you know built for the last 20 some odd years, 30 or 20 years. Uh, we've been here uh, 21 and a half, years. 21 and a half years, yeah. you know, right. And, and that's a f- also a fair you know argument to say, like, you built this business. Of course, it's in your own you know, best interest, mm-hmm. you know, to go that route. But, you know, in an industry where, you know, so much has had to be mitigated by middlemen and distributors because of this three tier system, what you've done is you've also taken data out of the equation. You know, one of the things that makes uh, businesses more profitable and more able to answer consumer demand now is because they have a tighter, you know, the relationship with their end consumer. Mm -hmm. They can also look at those purchasing trends. They can see what's actually selling. You know, if you were, uh, you know, Odell or New Belgium, you know, 15 years ago, getting the data from a distributor as to what's actually selling at retail, Mm -hmm. you know, not just what the distributor buys and then how fast those or depletions are going out, you know, because that still doesn't give you as a brand the the real understanding of how fast consumers are really buying the thing, Um, you know. Being able to get that data as a business and be able to respond to it quickly is one of the things that these smaller breweries who are selling direct to consumer mm-hmm. are really you know, creating an advantage from because they can immediately see what people are buying on tap, what, what you know, cans every mm-hmm. week people are taking out of their tap room. And they can, in two or three weeks, make brewing decisions about what, what they're going to brew next mm-hmm. versus you know, New Belgium or Odell who might have to wait four or five or six months to actually oh, yeah. get a real picture of what that data is on any beer that they make, you know, and we know, I mean, the retail world is much faster than that right now. So, mm-hmm. you know, again, is, is, is there something that's philosophically wrong with trying to kind of collapse that a bit? No, I, I get that, but that's not what the industry is and that's not yeah. the way it's set up. And, you know, we have restrictions on there and they have served us very well. Um, and getting rid of that, I don't think in, gives us an end point that's better for the consumer, you know? I, I really Wouldn't it don't. be a better endpoint? You know, and again, just for argument's sake, mm-hmm. what if uh, you know if breweries can, like you said, make beer that's more relevant to people and make more of that, and like less beer that's not relevant you're, to their consumers? But you're getting you're going right back into the same boat that you were in before, which is that you have tied houses, so the bars or the the retail outlets, you have one choice of what you're drinking, and. That's not what this industry was set up to do. Well, I guess the industry was choice, and you know, because now you're going to have to go. I'm going to have to go from this place to this place to this place just so that I can drink different things. And so you have a choice of seventy different tide houses in Colorado, in in Denver, you know, basically. Right. Yeah. And and you know, I'm I'm and I'm not saying all tied to their own brewery. Right. And and the the other thing is, you know, in this whole article, I never said that. We should change the laws to prevent any of this stuff. I never said that you can't do any of this thing. I said that 
you need to pay attention to this kind of stuff because are you wanting to go out standing on one leg or are you wanting to go out there with those multiple points of distribution, the liquor stores coming up, the grocery stores, the multiple bars and restaurants and everything like that. That has always been the method to get to that larger size. Right. Just selling in your own place, you have one point of distribution. And if you're set up for that, that's that's just fine. That's 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 there's nothing wrong with that. There's yeah. nothing wrong with the neighborhood brewery. I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem is when you want to come around and you want to sell to me, but you're also opening up down the street from me. If your brewery's down the street from me, that's fine. I mean, that's not, you know, I've been carrying at least three or four handles from Great Divide. They're only six blocks away. I, that hasn't been a problem. But when you just jump into my neighborhood with a satellite loca- location, which is nothing but a tied house, that's what this whole industry was set up not to do. And I can choose not to carry your beer. And that's what I've chosen to do. And I've chosen also to tell you why I'm doing this. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. And I've explained it and I've gone through the entire thing of what the three tier system was set up to do, the problems it was trying to address, and how are there problems with it? Oh God. Like that that's, you know, another three hour discussion there. There are serious problems with, you know, distributors that are nothing but brand collectors. Sure. They just they get your brand and they just want to hold you and keep you from doing anything so that you can't sell against their brands that they already have. There are are, you know crazy laws. And I think at some level the three tier system we're gonna have to come to grips with this that uh, with the massive amount of consolidation that's now happening in the distribution world (sighs) and it's happening all over the all over the country. Mm -hmm. Um you know you have states where you might end up with as few as two distributors, you know, both Mm -hmm. of whom have you know some financial or at least one of whom has financial interests or ownership by one of the the large breweries and mm-hmm. so um you know conceptually speaking again like it's a little crazy that we have laws that require breweries to sell their product through a company that's owned by a, a company that wants to destroy them oh, or that you know that is absolutely not operating in any way in their interest and so oh, yeah. uh you know, I mean, that that does or, or prevented from carrying yeah. their beers, too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, here in uh, the Colorado, we have uh, almost the entire state. Uh, AB owns their distribution network. Here. Right. Um, there's like one or two wholesalers that are independent and they're in smaller markets up in the mountains and right. out west. But uh, in general, and they are, they, of course, will not carry any other sure. people's sure. brands but their own. So now you've taken that one out of the equation. Whereas um, back a few years ago before that was uh, the case or in some other states where they're prohibited from owning the distributorships, um, you had – you know, m- more options for access to the marketplace as a brewer going yeah. out there. Um, you had maybe three or four distributors that were of a sizable size for somebody like, say, a New Belgium who wants to be in, you know, all the grocery stores and all the liquor stores and all these different points of distribution. So they might have three or four or five options. And now with ownership coming into the picture from big beer taking over that thing and them being excluded from that one there in the consolidation that's going on you're getting less and less and less channels for access to that marketplace right. and people say oh well you know you know that just adds opportunity for you know a new guy to open up but let's just put it this way you don't see any larger scale distribution companies opening up you see small guys right and they might have one two three trucks and a few salespeople, and they can get out there and they can hit those super craft centric locations and they can get them done and they can do a really really great job of that but when you start getting into a little bit wider picture and you're looking at trying to get into more than just the top couple of grocery stores and more than you know just those couple of geeky restaurants like mine um then you start running into trouble because you can't you you don't have enough trucks to physically hit all those stops in a day and in a week and everything like that and you start you start having a really serious problem with that and um that's that's a really big problem that's coming down the pipeline and since a lot of states have franchise laws where you basically sign on with that brewery with that distributor and 
you know, I'm, I'm okay. And most, most breweries are okay with there being some sort of value to that. Because if there's value, hopefully that distributor is going to pay attention to you. Um, but um, sometimes the value gets a little bit crazy and it becomes impossible to get out of that contract. And in, right. in some states, it's flat out impossible to get out. You're married forever and ever. And that but, has yeah. caused problems, too. For sure. You know, the flip side of that here in Colorado and in a lot of other states, self, self-distribution up to a certain level is allowed. You know, in North Carolina, I think it's like 25,000 barrels. Here, there's not really a limit to that. No. Um, you know, and self-distribution provides another channel, you know, for uh, you know for those breweries to, to get out there and control the way that their brand is sold, the message to retailers. Um, but it's also, you know, in, in a lot of ways can be a very inefficient, a very cost inefficient strategy to take. Um, I, you know, it, it is a little heartbreaking for me to watch the sheer number of small breweries all operating their own trucks, all driving the same routes, all with different salespeople, you know, and thinking about the just, you know, just the immense amount of, uh, you know, financial waste that that entails for all of them. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I can see that for a lot of the smaller breweries in their growth phase. They want to it's worth investing in that to make sure that they have a relationship directly. Oh, oh with, at the beginning, it's absolutely know, it's key, a, yeah. a key thing. I mean, and, and it's, it's it's very good for the small breweries at the beginning, but usually about the time they get their third truck they start noticing like hey wait they, they start really seeing the cost of putting that truck on the road and ensuring right. it and that that other driver and the benefits and all these kind of things start going on they start going like wait a second i can just you know for a 30 percent discount give it to a distributor and they will deal with all that right. logistics right and, you know, it, people their f- expense for operating that truck is pretty much in line with the discount they'd have to give to that distributor to also sell that product. Yeah. Well, a lot of times it comes out way ahead. Yeah. You know, at, at the very beginning, I mean, you're concentrating on the physical dollars going through the system and, you know, taking that 30 percent hit really, you know, is like, oh, gosh, you know, that 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 would be rough. Um, but then when you start really adding up the costs as a business of what that is costing you to add on because usually also your insurance company starts looking at you differently when you get more than three trucks out there on the road they're yeah. like whoa, 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 whoa wait a second that's not quite what we sign and they and they they start upping your rates and and you know i, I mean i've been hearing this for years from breweries and they, they start looking at that and going like hey maybe maybe this is a better and more efficient way and then taking those people who had been delivering those things and turning them into sales people because they already have that that connection and 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 spending more time on the sales end of it and getting it out there and getting those placements and letting this delivery company um take care of the rest of it yeah and, and you know and people sit there and go oh my distributors i mean you know it's like they're making all the money it's like you the normal markup, you know, for most distributors across the United States is is just under thirty percent, you know. Yeah. And and I mean, these are things that you can look up, and the average is just under thirty percent. And and you know, it's a lot. It's a very capital intensive business. Yeah. And it ties up. There's got a lot of thing in product and and equipment and warehouses and in trucks and. And, you know, and, and if they're they're lucky and if they make a couple percent on all that money, they're they're ecstatic at the end of the year. But it's a couple percent on a very large number. Right. So it's, it's it's a large number of dollars that they're making. And, you know, I'm not not trying to, you know, paint a like, oh, poor distributors. But at the same time, you know, um, there's some of them that are actually pretty good. I mean, I, I usually say like all distributors are evil and some are less evil. But uh, and I'm still going with that one after 35 years. So I think it'll be interesting to watch over the next you know 10 years as you know the the world of logistics has been blown apart. You know as as Amazon has really come mm-hmm. in and uh, revolutionized uh, you know that whole idea of getting products to consumers, and it's continuing to to change. I don't know how that's going to imp- impact the beer distribution world, um, but mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of beer distribution. You know, and, and I say this coming out of an experience because we did own a beer bar for a good solid year. <laughs> Um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the distribution business, it's weird and it's very antiquated in the way that sales happen. And I guess antiquated is one way to put it. Relational is another way to put it if you wanted to put a more positive spin on it. But, you know, in a state like Colorado, where we are, 
um, you know, with a lot of independently owned places where there's no, not anything centralized in the whole, you know, buying strategy, you have to have a lot of reps to go hit the pavement and go put yourself in front of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, you know, it's a very personal, but also very inefficient way to, you know, to get out there that, uh, you know, you, there. you have to think that there's some opportunity for disruption in the world of beer distribution that streamlines some of that process. But does and, it become a benefit for you? And yeah. the, here's, here's, I mean, there, for instance, people are doing, uh, trying out online sales, basically, yep. uh, point and click and, and order your beer. Um, but you know, I've always found that there is a value in that rep coming by, uh, especially for the larger wholesalers. Uh, and so far the wholesalers have, the distributors haven't found that, um, that it, that it benefits them, that there's still some sort of benefit to having that rep out yeah. there in that FaceTime, that they have more sales than they would be, you know, cutting costs by getting rid of them. Sure. Um, and, you know, if you've got a decent rep, like for a, a large wine and spirits house, and they've got 40,000 SKUs, and if you have the right reps who are good, you can go to them and say, look, I am not interested in the 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 newest flavor of you know de kuiper schnapps um because i don't you know i'm a beer bar and i want to have a couple of nice wines and i want to have a you know some decent liquor i don't really make cocktails i mean other than it's it's straight up on the rocks splash of water basic soda mixers that that kind of stuff very simple cocktails it's like i'm not interested in all these things talk to me about the things that are in my wheelhouse. I want to know about that new beer that you got. I want to know about, you know, that new local whiskey that you started bourbon that you started carrying or something like that. You know, those things that interest me, like cut out all this chaff, yeah. come and talk to me about the serious stuff. And if you get uh, reps like that, that is, it's just, it's amazing because they can save you so much time because, you know, I, I get, you know, I don't know, there's probably two dozen people send me an email every Monday morning that I get of what they have in stock. And it's yeah. just like, it's like, you know, I've, I've over the last 35 years talked with bar owners that, that are just flat out. Like they want to do everything they can to avoid ever seeing a salesperson at all. They, <laughs> they, they duck out the sure, back door. Sure. They, they, they'll run, they, you know, they're like, Oh, they just waste my time. And I'm like, um, have you sat there and counted up how much time I spend scrolling through all that stuff to find the uh, few things that I might be interested in? Yeah. That's what the rep job is, is to tell me like, Hey, here's the things that, you know, have worked for me in the past in this place. Here's that new barrel aged, uh, uh, coconut Porter just came out. Um, you know, we have these things. Are you interested in them? Yes. Okay. Move, let's move on. And those interactions can be very short and, yeah. and can yeah. and get out there and, and be very efficient. And so far people are finding that, you know, there is a, an advantage to that. There is a sales advantage to that. You can sell more product. Now, um, if you took that salary out and you sold a little bit less, are you netting more money is what you're, you're trying to get at it and everything like that. And that's something that people, you know, maybe will find out uh, getting rid of salespeople. They're, that's what they're doing. That's what Amazon does with everything like that. But Amazon is also basically like a contract brewer, you know. They're like PBR. You know, they were relying on other people's infrastructure yeah. to get their product out there. And if they all of a sudden make it so that the infrastructure no longer exists, where are, where are they? And I, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Do you want to do you even want to be in a business that operates that way? That, uh, you know, that loses that human touch and that loses that nuance and loses that connection between the businesses you know, the, that's the what, yeah. that's what this whole industry was founded on, you know, 35, 40 and, and more years ago was, was that, that personal touch because, you know, there used to be, you know, you know, I'm not overly exaggerating by saying there were three beers out there. It's, it's, it's a little, little bit of a, of a stretch. I mean, there were 40 liquor, there were 40 brewing licenses in the United States at a, one point in the seventies. And, they were all making basically the same beer. I mean, you might have a slightly colored version of the same beer. Right. 
and you know a couple of people were making something different. I mean, you know, Anchor, you know, this, that weird steam beer, you know, it was bitter and uh, it was heavier bodied and and it actually had flavor, you know. And then then Ken Grossman starts making Sierra Nevada Pale. Yeah. Oh, yeah. holy crap! It's super bitter, you know. And and uh, that was that was what this whole thing was about. And then it was right. also about having that connection. There was, you know, there is that pilgrimage that you make to to go to chico and and see that you know see your nevada or go to anchor or go to new belgium or you know great divide down the street there's that there is that there is a value to that and that's what this whole industry was founded on and the infrastructure that was there is that distribution network that tier yeah. and it is those bars and restaurants and liquor stores and grocery stores that are willing to carry your product and that's super important and that's what this whole industry was founded on and are we putting that in danger sure and i'm not trying to i'm you know like i said before i'm not trying to say you can't do these things because if you found the loopholes to get around like claiming that your wife runs the production brewery and you run the the uh restaurants and stuff like that yeah um yeah you know you you know if you found those loopholes okay fine but are 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 you setting yourself up for a situation for success next year yeah, or 20 I, years and from I, now and i think like that, that you know at what at what price you know do you make a profit like profits oh, important yeah. all of our businesses need to be profitable to continue operating and be sustainable Correct. there's nothing wrong with making a profit this no. is you know this is what we do you know but we balance profit with all sorts of other factors, you know, mm-hmm. quality of service to the, the customer, you know, our relationships with, you know, those vendors that we work with, you know, quality and of life for yourself, quality of life for yourself, you know, and so all of those, you know, have to, to work together and, you know, in, in some sort of, you know, system of give and take, you know, and uh, I, I think what you say is, is true. We don't want to lose sight of that human connection between the artists and craftsmen making beer, mm-hmm. those that sell it and have a passion for turning consumers on and, and you know presenting beer to them and you know in the best possible way you know and those customers you know who are so passionate and into exploration or into consistency and across that spectrum because all of you know all of those experiences are worth it you know all mm-hmm. of them are valid and uh, all of them have to be considered as we move this whole thing forward I mean you know there's you know, I can give you an example of somebody who has not gone that route of of trying to have the multiple you know, retail experiences out there and uh, uh, started out in Kalamazoo, Michigan, Larry Bell with, uh, you know, Bell's Brewing Company. And he's been very adamant about uh, not opening up right. satellite rooms. I mean, he most of the time lives in Chicago now and he has been very vocal about not going down that route. He's yeah. like, look, Chicago is, was the market that made my brand. And why do I want to go compete with the people that helped me get here? And, you know, he's actually done pretty well. I mean, he's continued to grow. Some, some could say. <laughs> yeah. No, no, Bells has done fantastically well. I mean, for you know, sure, they, they, sure. they've done a great job. I mean, yeah. he gets real estate people coming up to him in Chicago yeah, no, all bet. the time saying, I've got bet. a perfect location. He's like, I don't want to do that. Well, Chris, mm-hmm. it's about time for us to wrap up. Um, yeah. Before I let you go, uh, a question. A couple of the beers that you find yourself going back to over and over again. You know, exploration is great, but, uh, you know, tell, tell me a few that are uh, in your personal arsenal of beers that uh, you just find yourself going back to over and over again. If you come to my house, there is going to be Sierra Nevada Pale Ale in the bottom crisper of yep. my fridge 90% of the time. Yeah. Uh, when I'm drinking here at the bar, um, the beers that I go back to all the time are Blind Pig IPA. I, I, I just can't drink enough of it. Uh, the STS Pills has been my favorite since we got it like three weeks ago. and <laughs> We've already killed like yeah, three yeah. kegs. and it's Thank just, you, Russian River, for yeah. opening a new production brewery <laughs> yes. and making enough of that beer to get it out here to the rest of the country. Yeah. And then another one that I am just drinking every day is Bierstadt Pills, the Slow Pour Pills. It's yeah. just absolutely stunning and Bill and Ashley do just such an amazing job, and yeah. and um, those those beers I am on 
all the time. I mean, there's you can listen to a previous episode of this very podcast to hear from Bill and Ashley about how they make slow pour pills. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's it's you know it's it's wonderful, and yeah. and those yeah. are the beers that I just keep coming back to. And, sure, and sure. people ask you know what's your desert island beer, and I'm like it's you know you're going to be very disappointed because it's it's Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. It's just interesting enough yeah. that I can drink it every day, but at the same time, you know I, I you know you can drink five or six of them and still be standing. Yeah. You know, and, and those are the kind of things that I, I really enjoy. And, and I try, you know, God, probably a thousand beers a year would not be an exaggeration at all. Uh, people bringing me stuff all the time. And I love trying new beers. And I, I, I think there's some great beer being out, made out there today. There's also a lot of schlock out there today. Um, and hopefully they'll get the message and, and figure out how to not make it taste like uh, some movie popcorn or, or other off uh, flavors. But no, I'm, I'm just, uh, I love that and I love exploring. I love visiting breweries and I love the camaraderie and, and the community that we've built over the last, you know, three or four decades of this thing. And I, I want to, I want to fight for it and I want to hold on to it and I don't want it to go away. I think that there's huge value in it. Absolutely. Well, cheers. Chris Black, cheers. Falling Rock Tap House, <laughs> named uh, Best Beer Bar in the World by the uh, readers of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine in our 2018 reader survey. And I uh, handed Chris his trophy for that earlier today as, they, yep. as we rolled in here to Falling Rock. Uh, congratulations. Well, thank you very much for and, that. And uh, yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for talking with us here on the podcast. Absolutely. Have a great day. Thanks. Uh, if you've enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform uh, you listen to podcasts on. If you've enjoyed our conversation, you can subscribe also to craft beer and brewing magazine at beerandbrewing.com. also check out our brewing industry guide if you are one of those members of the industry that uh, you know enjoy the inside baseball talk like we've had here uh, brewing industry guide.com we'll be back next week with another episode cheers cheers Join us next June for the Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine Brewers Retreat to the Ultimate Brewing Experience in Booth Bay Harbor, Maine. Don't miss the chance to brew with some of the world's best brewers like Jason Perkins of Allagash, Phil Wymore of Perennial, Will Myers of Cambridge Brewing, Neil Fisher of Weldworks, Sean Lawson of Lawson's Finest, Sam Richardson of Other Half, and more. Enjoy fabulous food, fantastic beer, and a -a one-of-a-kind brewing experience at an oceanfront luxury resort. Tickets are selling fast. Visit BrewersRetreat.com or give us a call at 888-875-8708, extension 0, to secure your spot now. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.com.